We just made history, our first ever close above 5,000, as well as 14 up weeks out of 15. So what does this mean for markets? Today, we talk about what normally happens to markets at the highs and how to navigate it. But we also need to talk about earnings. Revisions are happening under the hood. Plenty are saying it's a rational exuberance, but we're going to take the emotion out of it and look at the data objectively. So keep all hands, legs inside the vehicle at all times, and let's talk shop about stocks and the financial markets together. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Daily Recap Show, where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. So if you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell. Let's get into it. A pretty good day in the market today. I mean, have a look at energy. They were red. Consumer defensives were also red, led by the flows in Pepsi. Other than that, pretty green across the board, actually. I mean, sure, you could say it was pretty muted in healthcare. But if you actually have a look at most of the market, I mean, financials teetering between flat and green. Sure, banks put up a pretty average day, but it was a pretty green day across the board and breath wasn't bad either especially in small caps they did a pretty good job great outliers have a look at semiconductor manufacturing equipment these guys were the real winners today as well as semiconductors as a whole infrastructure tech to amazon tesla and when the big boys participate you know the market really tends to rally and we saw that look at the s p 500 versus the nasdaq nasdaq was up 0.97 percent the s p 500 up 0.5 percent but the real winner is the iwm and guys the reason why we're seeing this type of price action right now is entirely due to earnings two weeks ago the russell 2000 was reporting negative 12 percent earnings for the quarter it's now reporting negative nine percent and the same is true for the nasdaq the s p 500 min caps and we're going to talk extensively about earnings and what it means for the rest of 2024 and 2025 bonds are absolutely selling off and i think everyone is selling bonds getting into equities because why get five percent per year when you can get five percent per month trading semiconductors now the s p 500 has been up 14 out of 15 weeks and this is what normally happens so 12 months on we can expect a return of about six percent median 8.45 percent and the hit rates across the board actually very good anywhere from 75 to 100 percent of the time it will be higher now we could see here that we between one three and six months we actually normally get fairly muted returns and then we get the outsized move six months onwards that being said in this period we should actually look for dip buying opportunities especially as we know the macro environment is very conducive to growth right now and that earnings is looking very very good and we're going to talk about that guys now this is something very very interesting this is 1985-86 versus 2023-24 it's two analog years that you can compare it doesn't really mean anything but I just found it interesting nonetheless. Okay, so the calendar year 85, 23, those were the returns. January, this was the returns, right? Now Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, you can actually see a ton of similarities between the two. Yes, there are divergences, but what you really wanna look at is less of the exact number and more of the initial path. So you can see uh, high single digits, high single digits, low single digits, negative returns for Q3, then Q4 double digit returns, right? And look at Thanksgiving week, slightly positive, slightly positive. Look at the Grinch, exactly the same, crazy. Look at December's returns. Okay, so this is 85, this is 23. Now what can we expect and project forward into 86, into 2024? Now in 1986, the first five days of the year were negative 1.5%. November 19th to Jan 19th, the turn of the year. And by the way, we looked at both of these extensively, 4.91%, 7.22%. What did 1986 return? 29.22%. Where are we right now in the cycle for 2024? Well, we've pretty much returned about 6% for the year. The actual number is 5.98. And can we expect a 30% return year in 2023? Well, with the way earnings are tracking and everything is dependent on earnings right now, I think it's a bit of a long shot, but I wouldn't rule out another 10% returns in the S&P 500. Now let's have a look at market breadth. The S&P 500 had something like 370 winners, 130 losers. Pretty good breadth across the board. Most of the big guys were in a year and that's why we were fairly positive. Now looking at the Russell 2000, this was crazy. 1,380 winners, like 120 losers in the index and just absolutely outsized moves. And it's quite simple. Two weeks ago, negative 12% earnings for the Russell 2000. We're now sitting at negative 9% for the quarter and that's tangible you know what is that going to look like next quarter the quarter after that do we return a positive earning growth in 2025 
If that's the case, the market's going to start pricing that in. So yeah, great breadth across the board. And yeah, now looking at sectors and the best performing sector, no surprise, semiconductors. We saw regional banks up there as well. And regionals, you know, some of that fear that we saw uh, in the New York City Bank Corp situation last week, start of this week, starting to dissipate. People are becoming less fearful of the whole situation. You know, they realize that, hey, this bank is actually well capitalized. And that's why we're starting to see some of this trade back in regionals. And that's why Russell 2000 is moving higher because 18% of the Russell 2000 is regional banks. Now we're also seeing, you know, technology, software, discretionary, the big winners, you know, this again, really the Magnificent Seven, really moving higher, you know, holding the entire market together. But the SPY up 0.56%. And again, you know, good day for utilities, real estate. Again, with the regional bank trade, we do know that a lot of commercial is in this ETF and a lot of real uh, regional banks hold commercial real estate. For the time being, everything's look, looking all right for regional banks, but I still think there's a bit of stress in there that we're gonna feel further down the line in the year, but that's tomorrow's problem. Looking at financials, the big boys, financials are holding up well, materials to industrials. Pretty good day across the board. The worst performing sector was energy, GDX, these mining names, as well as staples being a dumpster fire after Pepsi's earnings. Now, there is some trade opportunities we will be looking at early into next week. So next week is the week before President's Day week. It's called pre-President's Day week. And on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we will be looking at taking certain trades. Now we could see here when the calendar year is positive, and we currently are positive for the calendar year, these are the returns we can expect in pre-President's Day week, every single day of the week, but especially Monday to Wednesday. The Monday to Wednesday, the average return is 0.77%, 82% of the time higher, so quite a high win rate. It does get a bit dodgy on Thursday and Friday. We want to be out those trades, especially with OPEX. This Friday right here is OPEX. But the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday tends to be very positive. And since the year 2000, average return 1.1% in those three days. And what you really want to look for is some form of a dip on Monday to ride the wave on Tuesday into Wednesday and then close the trade on Wednesday. That being said, it's a fairly positive day throughout the week, except for the OPEX Friday. You can see average returns of 0 0.17, 0 0.13, 0 0.5 on the Wednesday, and then 0 0.03 on Thursday. So ideally, you want to be out on the Wednesday. But for those investors who like risk, you can actually hold into Thursday. History is on your side ever so slightly. Now looking at earnings, we had actually a very good week of earnings, all things considered, but let's talk about Pepsi because they reported Friday before the open. The market was sort of half and half. It was neutral on the results and that's because they reported EPS of 1.78 against 1.72. They missed on revenue by quite a lot, actually. Organic revenue was up 4.5%, and this is actually the number that matters, and then a $1 billion share buyback program. But their outlook, they beat on their EPS outlook by one cent, but their organic revenue missed the streets mark. Overall, not good earnings, not great earnings, not bad earnings either, just your standard run-of-the-mill earnings. But for a company this mature, to still see at least 4.5% growth, EPS growth and expected organic growth, I guess it's all right. You can't really hate on it. You're not really trying to get outsized returns with Pepsi. What you're really trying to do is just protect your capital, collect the dividend, collect some capital appreciation with this buyback. That's really all you're trying to do. And the week is done, guys. This is a poll I do every single weekend. We will be doing one this weekend. And I pretty much ask you guys the next 100 points in the S&P 500 to gauge bullish sentiment for the week. 47% of you said up, 53% of you said down. And the bears did get the jump early on in the week, but the bulls pulled through. That being said, pretty neck and neck. I would say that this is pretty close, but a slight edge to the bears. However, 14 weeks out of 15 in the green. So go ahead, subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you can partake in these polls, guys. It'll come up on your feed. But moving on to a more comprehensive survey, the AAII sentiment survey, 49% bullish, 28% neutral, 22% bearish. And each and every single week, we see slightly less bears. And that's because the market just keeps going up dips getting bought. And if that's the case, people will eventually capitulate to the neutral side 
to the bullish side. Now, we also got the NAM exposure numbers and all this is fund managers exposure to US equities. So right now, fund managers are 93.77% exposed to US equities. And the truth is right now, US equities just work. They're growing earnings, buying back shares, providing immense shareholder value. And they also tend to be the most dominant companies, not just in the US, but throughout the world. Look at Apple, Microsoft, Nvidia, Tesla, Google. And that's why fund managers are nearly 100% exposed to US equities. Now this number can actually go above 100, like you see right here. And that means fund managers are leveraged in US equities relative to their portfolio value. Now, like I said, US equities just work and their fundamentals are actually pretty good. This is the S&P 500 three month percentage change versus the percentage price above or below the 200 day moving average. And you can see here that the majority of stocks, and we know that these are the big boys, the heavily weighted ones as well, are both above the 200 moving day, the same amount they are above their three month price average. And this is a very, very strong indicator. This right here is extremely strong and bullish and shows strong technicals and fundamentals in US stocks. Now, keeping up with the theme of fundamentals, let's have a look at the earnings scorecard because this changes day by day. I know I showed you guys this yesterday, but if we actually have a look, this went from 8.1% in the S&P 500 to 9%, and this is blended earnings growth updated February 8th. And essentially the S&P 500 for the fourth quarter 2023 is reporting 9% growth excluding energy we're looking at 12.3 percent growth in the s p 500 double digit growth and this is why equities are soaring especially in the s p 500 moving on to the russell it's a different story blended earnings growth of negative 9.6 percent that's something you don't want to see and that's why russell 2000 equities are where they are right now the best performing sectors in the russell however real estate healthcare tech utilities in there everything else in the green look at comps services, detrimental earnings growth. That's crazy. Energy, negative 35%. Consumer staples, negative 23.6%. And if the Russell does want to rally, it really has to improve this, not just at an index level, but at a sector level too. Now, a lot of the earnings in the S&P 500 has come from the Magnificent Seven, but as we have seen earnings revisions move to the upside, I mean, we've went from one point, negative 1.7% .1 earnings two weeks ago to excluding energy, 12.5%. Crazy earnings revision in that time period, what we're actually starting to see is the 493 is set to outpace the Magnificent Seven by the fourth quarter. So what we're actually seeing is Magnificent Seven growth all the way into the third quarter is going to hold up this market. And then from here, we're actually going to see the 493 take over. And you want to know something crazy? This number right here was 4% just a couple of weeks ago. So the fact that earnings revisions are coming in like this is absolutely crazy. Now these are probably gonna get revised down, but to what level? If we go from 21%, 16%, that's still a crazy, crazy number when you think about it. So yeah, we're seeing earnings revisions in the Magnificent Seven. They're gonna continue to hold up this market, especially in the next two years. But we are starting to see the 493 earnings revisions tick up. And what is this gonna look like in 2025? I'm very, very interested. And every day as earnings goes on, on this week and for the rest of this year, if these numbers do materialize, the index just gets cheaper, especially if in 2025, earnings look very much the same, maybe not like 34%, 20%, but we're looking high single digits, low double digits, the market just gets cheaper every single week, the closer we get to 2025. Now let's talk about the consumer, some great data I got here. Now consumer confidence has improved. You can see it used to be in the dumps here in 2022, start of 2023. And this is perhaps in part following lower gas prices. Remember when gas was spiking at the start and middle of last year? Since gas prices have eased, consumer co sentiment has also increased. Now this is the University of Michigan consumer sentiment, this blue line, and this is the average gasoline price, but it's been inverted and you can see here that sentiment generally follows the price of gas that's actually very interesting and i didn't know that but a large proportion of americans continue to view inflation as a top concern now americans were asked this question in a survey will these challenges get better or worse in 2024 60 percent of americans said inflation was going to get worse as well as well 
over 50% for all the other questions. The ability of people to earn a livable wage, affordable housing, and income and wealth inequality. So all in all, even though consumer sentiment is improving, sentiment around the general cost of living seems to be in the actual gutter. And it's really something that the government should really, really work on as a whole. Now, the reason why Americans feel like this is simply because of inflation. Have a read of this. Households typically make a disproportionately large number of transactions at restaurants, bars, groceries, and gas. So food services and drink, groceries, gasoline, general merchandise. These are the biggest things that households buy on a daily basis. And it's no surprise, you know, let's say you have a family of four, two adults, two kids, you're buying plenty of gas to get them to soccer practice, to get them food, groceries, you're probably taking them out. You can't just have your kids at home all the time. And here's the issue. Even though inflation is coming down and cyclical stuff like gas, those prices do come down. They, it does fluctuate. Stuff like food at home, stuff like food away from home has actually not seen the same moderation in price as gas has. And that's why American sentiment, consumer sentiment with regards to the survey I just showed you is sort of in the gutter. And we know we had Jerome Powell come on 60 Minutes and he pretty much said, your cost of eggs, the cost of bread, the cost of milk, that's never going down. The general price level doesn't go down. Things affected by commodities may go down. The general price level doesn't end. And that's why Americans worry about inflation because they can still feel this in their budgets every single day. But that being said, Americans do have jobs. We got the initial jobless claims data and it came in slightly better than expected. Still in line though, you could see actual initial jobless claims. Consensus was 220, came in at 218. Continuing claims came in at 1871. The consensus was 1878. So pretty good employment data. The American labor market continues to be secularly tight and we just don't see any signs of it breaking for the moment. And at the same time, we're also seeing GDP now at pretty high levels. The Atlanta Fed's GDP now is sitting at 3.3%. That's very, very high. That's strong economic growth. The problem with this though, is that it's coming a lot from government spending. 27.9% federal spending as a percentage of GDP. And we can see the revenue they're taking in is 18.1%. So pretty much what this is saying, right, is that the government is spending two to three dollars of GDP to get one dollar of revenue from it. So they're spending, that's not sustainable and eventually this issue is gonna have to be addressed very, very severely. But we're talking years, decades, even a century down the track. Now let's switch gears and talk about the market. Now the S&P 500 has been in a secular bull market since 2013. In 2008, we had the GFC. The market came down about 50%. Then after that, we rallied. When we broke the high before the 2008 GFC, that was the breakout of the new bull market in 2013. The average bull market lasts about 26 years years and we're about 10 years into this bull market. So we have about another 12 to 13 years left in it. However, we have seen quite the run in the last 10 years, but specifically in the last two years, what this bull market is missing is IPOs. Now, according to Goldman Sachs, that could change sometime this year because the macro is becoming more conducive to IPO activity and the GS IPO issuance parameter is sort of sitting around where it was in 2012. 2015, 2018. These are the inputs to the Goldman Sachs issuance parameter. You guys can go ahead and have a look at this. And hopefully we do start seeing a lot more IPOs because it's really good for the marketing, it increases uh, the market size as a whole. And it's just really, really healthy, especially these bigger IPOs. I'm not talking about small cap IPOs. I'm talking about IPOs like Arm, like Stripe, like Skims, you know, those type of IPOs. When they come to the market, it's really, really healthy for the market. And it's really, it's a sign that we're in a bull market. And let me give you an example. Look at 1995 to 2000. Look at the amount of IPOs we had in this period. Look at what we're doing right now. In 2023, we had 23 IPOs. Year to date, we only had eight. 2020, 2021, 261. That's crazy. 140 in 2020. Man, we had a pandemic. That is absolutely wild. Like that's that's just crazy to me. But yeah, this is this is what I mean. So you know, if we can get hopefully the macro environment does improve over the next couple of years to get about 100 IPOs a year. That's going to be really conducive to the market. It just means more liquidity into the market and it makes the market as a whole stronger. Now, let's talk seasonality. Now, guys, this is a really, really great chart. So this is the S&P 500 when the Fed has been slow to cut uh, rates, fast to cut rates, right? And then all fast cuts. So you can see here that when the Fed is slow to cut rates like we are right now, the market tends to rally. 
rally quite significantly. And the reason is very simple. When the Fed is slow to cut rates, it means the economy is good. And that's just the thing. If the economy is good and rates are high, there's no need to cut because the economy is completely fine. However, if rates are high and the Fed has to cut because there's a clear deterioration, we normally see that in the stock market and the Fed has to cut rates very, very quickly. And right now, with every, with the way the economy looks, the economy looks strong, labor market looks good, real incomes look good, everything about the economy looks really, really good, manufacturing's coming out of recession, the Fed can actually take its time with cutting rates. And when that happens, it's normally a very, very bullish sign. Now, looking at February seasonality, normally in February, what we want to look for is some form of a top around about this OPEX period for a downturn into the end of February. Now, I'm not saying that we are going to move lower based on what the market is right now. We're just going to keep cycling higher. But what I'm saying is that based on seasonality, we can actually expect for there to be quite a violent turn somewhere around the last week and a half near the OPEX time in February. Now, we may get a pullback. We might not get a pullback. No one really knows where the market's going to go. What, what, what I can confirm for you guys, though, is that with the way earnings is traveling right now, double digit growth, 12% X energy, 9% including energy, right? With the way earnings is traveling right now, the more the market trends sideways, the cheaper the market gets. And that could be a pullback in itself because the S&P 500 is producing more earnings. That means price relative to earnings is lower. Technically, that's a pullback in a way of speaking and the market gets cheaper as a result. So expect the pullback to either be in price, but with the way earnings is going, even a pullback in time, a correction in time is a perfectly viable pullback with regards to this. So the 5,000 gamma strike continues to be the core gamma resistance and it's really growing day by day. A lot is going to depend on what happens next week. I don't think the 5,000 strike is going to change until all of this gets rolled off into OPEX. And then I do think the market is going to take a breather. I think we're going to see very little amounts of gamma probably until the first week of March in my personal opinion. But right now, a lot of call gamma, a lot of positive gamma, and I, I wouldn't really fight the trend. This is gonna be a very hard zone for us to break above, but if we do break above, it's bullish. Even though, even if we do break above, look at the amounts of gamma still in here. Like $1 billion worth of gamma, worth of GX, is still a lot of GX. So even if we do break above the 5,000 strike, I expect very quick resistance and moves back into the 5,000 level. And there's gonna be a lot of volatility compression if we do break above the 5,000 strike. And the same is true if we just reject off it. The reason why we're sort of just doing this in the index is because there's a ton of gamma here, 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 5,000 and right above 5,000. And that's what positive gamma does. It compresses volatility. Whereas in a negative gamma environment, we expand volatility. So until all of this rolls into off OPEX, don't expect the market to do any form of a turn. All dips will get bought up until next week, Friday. However, again, we do want to watch where this rolls up or down to on Friday after Friday. Now, here Here's the daily chart for the S&P 500 and you know we're starting to look vertical again and it turns out that this area right here after Powell's speech was actually just a great dip buying opportunity for the move higher for the rest of this week or for the next week I should say. Now our game plan at the start of the week was if we break below here then we're going to see some weakness in the S&P 500. We did not. We did see a red day right there but we did see a lot of wicks come in towards the end of the day. And that's why the index has moved higher. And this chart looks very strong. You know, looking at this one year chart looks very, very strong. I mean, the five year chart looks strong as well. This is the weekly chart, you know, closing at the highs of the week, a little bit of de-risking right there into the weekend, which is completely normal. A lot of people were saying that this is like a double top with a higher high. I don't think that's the case. When you're like 5% above the previous top high, like you are right now, you just start pricing out those concerns as a whole. But yeah, this looks very, very bullish. And I mean, you know, I continue to remain with the stance that until we actually break this level right here, there's no technical damage on this chart. You know, it's this is a very key level. And until we actually break below here, that's when we could really start looking at lower levels. But until then, until this point gets broken convincingly, and I'm talking like a weekly close, maybe even multiple weekly closes below this level, 41.25, all dips are to be bought all the way for just higher price action, 51, 200, 50, 300, 50, 400, as earnings continue to just beat expectations. And no one is really talking about this at all. I mean, let's have a look at the monthly chart as well. 
itself that's very strong so far february closing at the highs of the month now we do know that based on seasonality we are expecting a bit of weakness in the s p 500 to occur towards the end of february but that could be in the form of a pullback it could also be in the form of a correction in time either way as it stands right now the monthly chart is at the highs and there's no reason to be bearish and there's not really much that you can say about these charts other than the fact that we're at the highs something that is a bit concerning though is that yields are ticking up quite significantly and that can have a, a tangible effect on mid caps and more specifically small caps but they seem to be holding in there as well i think they just seem to be looking ahead to the fact that rate cuts are coming this year and that rates in the short term will eventually ease after may june whenever we do get rate cuts but and we and we heard that with the fed speakers this week a lot of them did iterate the fact that there will be rate cuts this year and I do have some data I'm going to point out in the weekend video. So go ahead, subscribe to me so you don't miss the weekend video. And it just goes over pretty much how small caps tend to rally after the actual first cut in the federal funds. When you get that, then small caps make their outsized move. Up until then, trade the large caps, trade the big names. And the ADL line, guys, this line we've been watching has officially confirmed the breakout we're seeing you see right there we made a new high we made a new high in the adl line and great breath across the board exactly what you want to see in a roaring bull market it was looking a uh, really dodgy right there as it stands right now breath is good and it, the exact same thing in the nasdaq 100 similar situation in mid caps and mid caps actually have broken and closed above this high right here that's exactly what you want to see this chart is looking bullish what mid caps can go do now is go for this high maybe even next week go for that high close above that high that's going to be incredibly bullish for mid caps and then from there they can go start attacking all-time highs uh, in the mid cap index this is looking pretty bullish for mid caps but there is a bit of work to be done first looking at the russell 2000 let's look at the daily chart and yeah the russell 2000 has quite a bit of work to do first they do actually need to cross over this level close above it and then work its way to that high it's going to be a very big ask tomorrow especially because of the fact that earnings are negative nine percent for the russell 2000 okay that is simply a fact so we have to see how much can be priced in but as it stands right now this is bullish we actually made a higher low and what we do need to do next week is close above this line and then go attack the 2120 level around there and then from there we can really just start making our way to higher levels but you know let's take it one day at a time let's look at bonds and tlt is sort of finding support around this area here this 93 area a very very key level i do think if that if bonds do break this 93 level it's gonna look really grim for bonds and it hasn't looked except it hasn't looked stellar for bonds as a whole that being said if we do go ahead and plant a higher low right here that could be bullish but for the most part i think you actually want to look at more economic data look at the macro rather than technical analysis on a bond bitcoin is making crazy moves it's going back up for those highs next week it wants to go test these highs right here and then higher price action it just seems that after this uh, bitcoin etf sell-off this was a great buying opportunity because you're now significantly higher i think 12 percent higher than what you were just a couple of weeks ago the dollar is consolidating at this 104 level and that's really what we want to see we did have a stellar rally in the dollar and we did actually see if you go have a look at pepsi's earnings uh, if you go dive into the deep detail negative two percent was from constant currency effects changes so it actually had a negative two percent drop uh, the dollar is having an effect on earnings so we really do want to see this move a bit lower but we are finding support right here and hopefully we do get a move down in the dollar we actually did see energy stocks down despite the fact that oil was up 0.81 percent on the day very weird action but we are still consolidating in this range and what energy traders are really looking out for is a break above or break below that's what they really want and lastly something i want to show you guys is the semiconductor trade right here this is very interesting guys every time semiconductors have gone into overboard territory like they have right here right here right here we've got absolutely crazy rallies all the way up all the way up all the way up and and we just hit overboard territory right there guys just went into overboard territory right there and history would suggest we go even higher for semiconductors although there is so much priced in at this point right here. History never repeats. It just rhymes at the end of the day.
Data in the week ahead, guys. So the focus will be on CPI uh, and PPI, but there's retail sales in there as well. So we get on the 13th consumer price index year over year, month over month, we get CPI and core CPI. Then we also get some of the stock standard stuff, Empire Manufacturing. By the way, this was horrendous last month. I wanna see if there's actually an improvement. Initial jobless claims. We get the import price index. Then we get retail sales. And then we get PPI, I believe on Friday. Now, the difference between CPI and PPI, CPI is what we pay for inflation. PPI is what businesses pay for inflation. So they just got two different metrics there. And then we also got housing starts, building permits, pretty important data, very big week of data coming off a very light week this past week. But if you've made it up until here, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video. Cheers.